Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Lean Blog Interviews. I'm really thrilled that we're joined today again by Tom Peters. He was my guest previously in episode 382 of this podcast. It was back in early, well, August 2020. And he was a guest on My Favorite Mistake, episode 58. So I'm happy to say welcome back, Tom. How are you? 382 in 2020. What's your what's your number now, Mark? Uh, it's about four, almost 470. Jesus. But wow. Do, do to, I guess the answer is way to go. The alternative is what a glutton for punishment. Uh, but no, I think it's a, I think it's a terrific program and I and I love it. But that's a big number. It is. Uh, and, and that's over 16 years. And you could say way to go or get a life or either. Way. Good God. 16. No, but 16 years ago, you were uh, a capital P pioneer. That's all. That's uh, 06. Was. What was your what was your medium in 06? Uh, well, I mean, I did start with a podcast, but I was either phone calls or Skype and trying to make that. Work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Skype. That's that's what I meant. So, right. yeah, I remember I remember ye oldie Skypey. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're Skyping somebody. Oh, my God. That's just incredible. And that was but I, but I remember given my advanced age, I remember and friends who are 10 or 15 years younger than I, when long distance calls were occasions that were memorable and people would hang up on you in the middle of the call because it had been a 10 minute call and they knew they were losing so much money that they couldn't hang in. Yeah. But uh, I'm glad we can uh, zoom in together. You are zooming in from, from where? South Dartmouth, Massachusetts, which is on the South coast, 70 miles South of Boston and 15 miles from New Bedford, Massachusetts, which I only mentioned because it was the richest city either in America or the world from whale oil, which mm -hmm. lit all of our street lamps and so on. And then a couple of dorks in central Pennsylvania went out and discovered the hydrocarbons and that was all she wrote. <laughs> but better for the whales. Yeah. Um, if, uh, I, yeah, much better for the whales. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't hear your comeback. Yes, absolutely. But uh, if, if you want to learn more about Tom, uh, his website is tompeters.com or an even better way to get there, which I learned about from his new book, this URL, giveashitism.com. <laughs> I was so thrilled that that was available. What prompted you to get that domain name? <laughs> I think, as you know, I use Twitter. And as you know, I talk an awful lot incessantly about uh, taking incredibly good care of people. And I was trying to find a word that would really describe people who care and to describe it in language other than people who care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm an old sailor who sw still swears like a sailor, but I thought, you know, what, I mean, it really is a complimentary thing. You know, Mark really gives a shit about these programs. Mm -hmm. And that's stronger than Mark really cares. Yeah. And so I thought, what the hell? Let's see if, you know, as for a laugh, let's see if uh, giveashitism.com is available. And it was. Yeah. Because other curse words, that's a negative connotation. Yeah. He, he, well, it's, it would be more, well, you could say does give or doesn't give up. But thank you for not making it saltier. Than it was. Yeah, no, no, not not int not intended to be any saltier than necessary. But as I said, it was I couldn't find which was the point. Like care a lot, give a darn, whatever. I couldn't find anything which was as commanding and demanding as that made up term. Yeah. So we're going to talk today on Thomas' most recent book. I'm going to hold up for those watching on YouTube. Tom Peters' Compact Guide to Excellence. It is indeed compact and is uh, based on his previous book, Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. And so congratulations on, on the release of, uh, of this Thanks. book. Um, so Extreme Humanism, we, we talked about that last time. It was part of a manifesto you had published during the early COVID times before right. uh, it being a book. You mentioned Twitter. I was going to ask, you know, um, in, in terms of 
somebody who seems to illustrate kind of the opposite of a lot of the extreme humanism principles uh, is Elon Musk, now owner of Twitter. Um, Open-ended question here. I mean, just thoughts on at least what you read about Elon's management style. Well, we have to resurrect something about two paragraphs ago, which is how sub how severe my use of inappropriate language will be in describing him. Uh, I think it's his behavior towards staff in particular has been appalling. I think that the degree to which apparently and this is reading headlines because I don't care enough to read the three, 33 paragraphs, apparently giving much more free reign to Zuckerberg-like hatred development. Uh, I mean, I, there's only one asterisk, and I hate to say it because I really don't like the guy, but I need to be a teeny bit fair there was a headline, you may have seen it uh, a few weeks ago, that said in 2024, over 50% of General Motors profit will come from electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And you just, for whatever, Musk gets the credit for putting the electric vehicle on every man, meaning you and I, on our map. And the electric vehicle is incredibly powerful to dealing with climate change, et cetera. And so I, 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 I think his behavior has been awful. I think the way he's treating human beings is awful. I happened to be in an airport a few months ago and uh, overheard a conversation of four or five people in line and somebody must have said something and this woman spoke up and she said, no, my husband and I worked on his first startup and he was an asshole then, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's re really bad individual behavior, uh, but he, he gave us the damned electric car and everybody else has been copying, which is really incredible statistically and so on, because it's a, you know, the numbers are such that it's a teeny share of what's on the road. but the publicity made it a, a presence as well as the uh, degree to which the climate science stuff is mm -hmm. burgeoning. Yeah. Well, so, so back to that point of innovation for a minute, I mean, you know, you, you, as you write about here and you've talked about before, innovation seems to be much more likely to come from small to medium sized enterprises compared to big, huge corporations. What if you could just talk more, even if it's general, general about that dynamic and, and what happens when, the bigger companies wake up and start copying the innovator. Yeah. Uh, the statistics are overpowering. First of all, and I am pleading guilty here, the guru class, as much as I hate the term, basically focuses intentionally or not on the Fortune 500 and the FTSE 100. Uh, most important stat to me is that the Fortune 500 apparently employs something like 8% of us, meaning that 92% of us work for non-Fortune 500s or the SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises. The SMEs have, by a huge margin, created well over 100% of new jobs, meaning obviously that the F500 is dumping them and the, the make up is coming there. So, you know, shame on me and other gurus uh, who focused only on the big guys. Uh, you know, we could, we, I could go on, I would love to go on and on and on and on and on about that target. Uh, basically, I will go on to the sense of one paragraph just because I have to. It's required by my morality, Gene. In September 1970, the economics Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman wrote a book, wrote an article in the New York Times. And in the article, it said corporations have no social responsibility. 
And that wasn't an interpretation of the article. You can find the damned sentence. Uh, at that time, in 1970, 50% of corporate profits went to shareholders, executives, etc., and 50% went to people, research, and development, etc. cetera. Uh, my now discredited old buddies at McKinsey and Company repeated or did a study in 2014. And in 2014, what they discovered was that 91% of corporate profits go to share buybacks, stockholder stuff, uh, top dog pay, and so on. And nine frigging percent is left over for the workforce. And, you know, my problem with that, other than the obvious, is I'm willing to argue, a sociologist or an anthropologist might disagree, you can tie that to the despair and the disruption that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 91% or, or huge share people have left behind, been left behind, and a la our Musk comment, mm -hmm. uh, a huge share of the job cutting has been done in an unpleasant fashion. Mm -hmm. which would make me, uh, you know, ready to hear a radical here and there. And so um, you know, when you think about um, the conference board, I think is the, the group that put out a statement in you know, a couple of years ago. And in, 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 in your book here, I jotted this down. You, you referred, you used the phrase, the moral bankruptcy of maximizing shareholder value. The conference board put out a statement saying, hey, other things matter. We need to think about stakeholders. And like, do, do you see evidence of companies moving in that direction? Does it just seem like lip service? Well, first of all, I go back to the last question. Uh, there are, if you take the whole SME population, there are millions of businesses that, in fact, behave in a moral fashion. No mm -hmm. issue about that. Uh, and even among the bigger middle-sized companies, an enormous number. I'm afraid that I don't see much drift among the F-250 or F-500 in that direction. And, you know, what, interestingly enough, and it's something obviously we should talk about, what may drive them a little bit in the right direction is the work from home stuff where you can't get away with, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a different kind of morality. Uh, you, you know, my father was garden variety. He worked for the same company, the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, a utility for 44 years. And that was the standard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people have said nice things about my brand you book. And I said, you know, first of all, they get it all wrong. They think it's about self-marketing. Mm -hmm. I said, what it is about is you can no longer, and this was, you know, brand you book had its 25th anniversary this year. You can no longer depend on a long-term job anywhere. Right. And, you know, so sell with a lowercase s, not self-market. You've got to be We've, we've got to say mark and it's got to stand for something, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, again, I, I think I think about it and I, I'm more than willing. And I have I did it in print in a new book to trash McKinsey with him for whom I worked for eight years. And I think a moral fashion in the San Francisco office. Uh, but the first the rule I learned, which is kind of an interesting rule on day one, was you never want to be recruited for a project because you were available. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to be have such a fabulous reputation that seven people are attempting to steal you mm -hmm. from your current project. And it's not an assign and that that's you know that's what I meant. And presumably in professional service firms, that's not self-marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not hide in a closet. Uh, but it, it's just, you know, I want to work with this guy because I've watched and seen what she can deliver here or there or what have you. And that's that's a whole different story. 
Yeah. And what, what people say a lot now maybe is an extension of the brand called you and other things you've highlighted. Uh, you know, people will say, no one else is going to look out for your career, but you. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to put a big asterisk on that. Mm -hmm. No one is going to look out for you except you and your network. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's literally you are as powerful, not as yourself, but the relationships that you've made over the years. So you are not alone, but it's, it's got to be really developing things that people are remembering you about doing things socially, doing community work or what have you. But you've got to be known as a, as a person back to the moral thing who contributes. Yeah. It was somebody I'd want to hang around with, uh, as well as the fact that she or he happens to be a really top flight coder in this little corner of the, uh, of the AI world. Mm -hmm. And in, in the book, you also said, I'm, I'm just going to read a, a quick quote and, and get some of your additional reactions to it. Being good is good business. When you take the high moral ground, it's difficult for anyone to object without sounding like a complete fool. So when you think of taking the high moral ground of we're not going to do consulting work for an autocratic dictatorship somewhere. That's redundant to say autocratic dictatorship, I guess. But or um, we are not going to, um, you know, uh, come in and, 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 and fire 50 percent of our people and pressure the rest of them into working you know, extreme hours and what might be terrible conditions. I mean, this sounds like there's there's a question of moral ground here. It's not just well, a matter of, is it going to make us money or not? Since you're reading from my book, uh, I get to also. Yeah, you'll do it better. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the toughest part of writing a book is picking an epigraph. That is six lines that will be on the first page that are supposed to define what follows. And the lines that I chose for this book came from Dame Anita Roddick, the body shop founder, the late Anita Roddick. And she said, I want, I want to work for a company that contributes to and is part of the community. I want something not just to invest in. I want something to believe in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that, that's, I will let uh, Dame Roddick you know, answer the question that 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 you asked. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm at a loss. I'm an old man. I'm tired. I have two and a half million miles doing twenty seven hundred speeches, and my frustration. You know, I, I, I've said in a smart aleck way that really isn't. I've said, if you want, you know, I've got a, I've got a PhD, but if you want to be able to understand what I've written, you must show me a signed certificate of completion of the fourth grade, because there is literally nothing that requires third order calculus that I learned as a Cornell engineer or what have you. It is some of the things we were talking about. It's, you know, there's this wonderful other quote. I used it here in earlier books. There was a three-star three -star army general by the name of Melvin Zace. And he spoke to the army war college middle level officers, presumably lieutenant colonels and majors and so on. And he went, da, 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 da. And he said, I want to finish up with one. I, I can't quote it exactly. I want to finish up with one thing one item that will bring you more joy, more success, contribute more to the United States Army than anything else. And he said, that is, you must care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love it coming out of a, you know, a guy who's an army guy. Right. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's just, it's fascinating. And, and, and take the military thing for a while. Uh, I grew up in the South, so you were required to like Robert E. Lee and dislike U.S. Grant. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, I started, first of all, I moved out of the South and got away from the worst attributes thereof. Right. Uh, that's another interesting story in and of itself, not unrelated to this commentary. But at any rate, I became a Ulysses S. Grant fan and then a fanatic. And here's the one story I remember. I think it was Vicksburg when Grant's troops wiped out 
a big part or significant part of the Confederate army. And after the battle was over, there were Confederate troops lined along a road and Union officers on their horse horses riding along that road. Uh, well, I don't know whether they had smirks on their face or not, but Ulysses S. Grant rode at the back of the line and he took his hat off when he began to ride the line. And I'm getting a shiver saying this. And he rode for something like six miles holding his hat in the air to respect the people who had been defeated in this battle. And that, and, and the, the other one, just to stick, and I hate to do this thing with the military thing with Zace and that. The other one I remember so strikingly um, is that the night or day before D-Day, the British commander, uh, Montgomery, gave apparently one of the great speeches of all times. The American commander, Dwight David Eisenhower, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm tearing up at this stuff, mm -hmm. went down to the beach, the D-Day beaches, and for several hours in a plain uniform with no stars showing, wandered along the beach, putting his arm around Mark and saying, I know it's going to be an impossible day, but what we're doing is important or what have you. Uh, you know, speaking thereof, since you're speaking to me from Cincinnati, hey, we're talking about good Midwesterners. Yeah. Grant was a Midwesterner. Uh, Eisenhower was a Midwesterner. Uh, you know, as I'm, I always loved hardly, hardly too clever, the definition of Chicago, New York without the attitude. And, uh, it's not untrue. Yeah. Are you, a, I know you're in Cincinnati. Are you a Midwestern or what were I you? I was born? born in Dayton and I grew up in Southeastern Michigan outside of Detroit. Hey, so yeah, Midwest. You got it. You got the credentials, <laughs> you know, no, no question about it. Yeah. And I, I, I've said, I said, you know, incredibly difficult time mm -hmm. and we got, Harry Truman from Independence, Missouri, and we got Dwight David Eisenhower from Kansas, and it was a good time to be run by slightly understated Midwesterners, even though we both know that's an incredibly simplistic comment. But one of those understated leaders, um, when, you, when, when you talk about caring about people and taking the high moral ground, you know, I, I think of, um, again, it's the late kind of like with um, Anita Roddick, uh, the late Paul O'Neill, who had been the CEO at Alcoa. On his, you know, his first days as CEO, he told the gathered Wall Street analysts that his top priority was employee safety and that nobody who ever worked at Alcoa should get hurt at Alcoa. Like, he, and, and, and hearing him retell it, like the Wall Street people thought he was nuts. Like yeah. CEOs don't talk about safety. But it was this spark. So to your point of like, nobody could disagree with safety. They might disagree that it was possible to drive it really close to zero. But that, that became the spark then for what he called habitual excellence. If you can get good at improving safety, guess what? You're going to be good at everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a term that all of our colleagues who are watching us, listening to us should remember it that something like that is contagious. Mm -hmm. You not only get the magnificent of a low, low accident rate, but it, it's a, it's a, it's just such a demonstration of caring and thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it, 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 you know, I, I was lucky and maybe I got it from my mother or what have you, but, I'm always fascinated and that you can change you can change the life temporarily of a grocery clerk if you have fun on the way out and you're smiling and you know I went to the store yesterday and I said oh my god I do pray that you will be able to live through these next 2 weeks before Christmas mm -hmm. and you know she got a grin on her face from that. And I, you know, I made her life a teeny bit better. I'm not bragging about myself. All I'm saying is it's, well, there's this wonderful experiment, which I just love. I, th I think it was in the book, uh, but it's how I start everything I do now. 
And the experiment was a teacher stands in the doorway of the classroom as the class begins. The kids are walking in and the teacher has got, you know, smiling, not a stupid ass grin, but teacher's smiling, says to everybody, mentions them by name, you know, hey, Mark, good to see you. Uh, hey, Ann, sounds to me uh, like your cold's getting better. You know, not, no sentences, no full sentences, mm -hmm. no more than a phrase. As a result of doing that, and these are long-term, hard-nosed, hard-ass research studies, as a result of doing that, behavioral, negative behavioral incidents measurably go down by something like 25%, mm -hmm. and measures of academic engagement go up by 20%. So, you know, you do a dramatic, dramatic implication of just you and I, I mean, let me, let me, let me tell you, if you let me wander from that one, mm -hmm. uh, I have an unmistakable, and I'm now 200 years old. I crossed the Delaware with Washington. I'm in the guy in the back of the boat with the oar uh, on the port side. Uh, but where was where was I going to go with that? <laughs> I completely. Oh, 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 okay. Be best day of my professional life, which is 200 years old. Uh, I got an assignment, which is we could go on forever. We don't have forever. That led eventually to In Search of Excellence, which is neither here nor there. My colleague, uh, my partner, Bob Waterman, who was the co-author, the late Bob Waterman and I worked in San Francisco. There was a medium sized plus company just about to get to the billion dollar mark down the road in Palo Alto called Hewlett Packard. Uh, you know, a giant now and like most giants has lost most of what made it great then. At any rate, Bob and I got get an interview with John Young, who's the president of HP. Uh, and we go down to Palo Alto, and the first thing we do at the front desk is say, we've got an interview with Mr. Young. We happen to live on the 48, uh, McKinsey, on the 49th floor of the Bank of America Tower in San Francisco. If you wanted to see the CEO, you would first be greeted by the executive assistant to the executive assistant, executive's assistant. <laughs> so we say, we have an interview with John Young. I swear to God, and I'm probably glorifying it a teeny bit, it couldn't have been more than 90 seconds later that this guy pops out of an office door and says, sticks his hand out and said, I'm John Young. Glad you guys are here. So we'd already had our first holy shit moment. So, you know, HS moment two was right on the way because he then takes us inside and his office was in the engine. This is a this is a billion dollar company. So this is not seven people in a whatever. Uh uh, our nearly billion dollar company te takes us into the engineering spaces and his office is an eight foot by eight foot cubicle with transparent walls that come up to about your nose. So mm -hmm. we are, we, we smelled that something was afoot, but the magic was somewhere in, in the interview. He introduced us to what they called the HP way. Mm -hmm. And the centerpiece was something called M B. W.A. Right. Or managing by wandering around. Uh, we were struck by it. But then near the end of the interview, he said, come on, guys. He said, you, you, you shouldn't believe me. Let's do a wander. And so we get up from the cubicle and, you know, spend 20 minutes walking through the nearby engineering spaces. No, in a billion dollar company, he did not know everyone's name, mm -hmm. but he knew several people's name. They were not in any way terrified by having the president next to them. And he would ask them a question and, you know, say something like, you know, I know you got a deadline coming up on the X, Y, Z project. Good luck for all our sake. Uh, and then he said to, for the grand finale, he said, come on, guys, there's somebody over in the corner I want you to meet. And there's this old fart intensively talking to a young engineer in front of one of the big computer screens of the age this was 79 and we are taken over to the side and john looks at bob and i and he said tom and bob i'd like you to meet bill hewlett hmm. uh you know you sh i'm glad there wasn't a tv camera on because i probably peed my pants when that when that happened but it was and and, and the point of it was 
Mr. Hewlett, I don't know what, he's probably in his 60s or late 50s. I don't know what it was in 79. But he's having this engaged, energetic conversation with probably a 28-year-old engineer pointing at a screen about some twist or tweak or turn on this thing that they were working on. And I said to many people, what I learned that day was that effective leadership is an intimate act. Mm -hmm. And I choose that word intimate with the greatest possible care. It is about human connection. Uh, you know, whether it's General Eisenhower uh, with his arm around the troop before D-Day, whether it's General Grant with his hat off uh, or just or Bill Hewlett and John Young having an intense conversation with somebody half their age. Yes. And the whole world turns upside down. Right. I mean, I, I, I know, you know, it's, it's a phrase probably shouldn't be used, but literally people will die for you, as they say in the military. Yeah. Right. So now you, you talk about you know the, this this leadership behavior, this intimate act. Um, you use this phrase now, management by zooming around. You know, when people are working from home, can we still have that same level of connection with people through Zoom? Well, let's start with you and I. Uh, I would love to be in a room with you. I have been in a room with people like you at roughly a jillion times. Yeah. But back to my prior comment. I think you and I are having as intimate a conversation as we would have if you were on one side of a desk with a microphone mm -hmm. and I was on the other side of the desk. Mm -hmm. And I say it's important thing for me to say. And the reason for that is when this stuff zooming started, I was holy shit. That's the end of human interaction. <laughs> uh, I couldn't even imagine what life would be like. Uh, and we've now reached the point, which I, I think is hilarious, when my wife has said this, when I do a 45-minute Zoom conversation, she said, oh, my God, you look as beaten as you did when you walked out of a room with a thousand people, you know, giving, if you can, your, your all. So. Right. And, 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 and then, you know, there, there are obviously a million other things that you could talk about. I, I always use my little example is I'm running some department and, you know, we have to have a couple meetings a week or something like that. And, you know, I'm doing an informal set of evaluations and I come up to Nancy and I say, Nancy, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something critical. And she you know, turns white. I said, listen. I happen to know that you have two parents and assisted living and two young kids. And I said, I'm mad at you. You haven't missed a single meeting and you've paid attention on every meeting. Mm -hmm. We are not anymore in the pro productivity maximization business. Please take the time off you need. Put your parents and kids first and, and, and so on. And, and, you know, that that to me is what and I think that can have. You know, pretty. I I don't want to I don't want to paint a picture which is a hundred percent rosy because I remember doing a TV show and it focused on this architecture company and they had built a new headquarters for themselves and outside the the restrooms were three or four chairs and you know they said when people come out of the restroom and somebody else does you sit down and chatter for five mm -hmm. minutes yeah. and you know a lot of good things happen through that randomness. And I am not sure that those can happen today. There was a guy by the name of, of uh, what was his name? David Bing or Stanley Bing. Stanley. Who wrote a column in Fortune Magazine forever and ever. <laughs> this, was, uh, this was probably in, let's say, 1970. And for those who watched Mad Men, you'll know what I'm talking about. He said, well, he said, trust me. The end of the three martini lunch is the end of innovation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hadn't quite worked out that way, but yeah. you know that that was the point: the the spontaneity of the you know the first beer or what have you. Right. Uh, but no, but nothing. It's okay. it's not an there's not an easy answer. I think the answer that's evolving 
is a couple of days in the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that may, I was, I went to a, to a choral performance, Christmas choral performance. My wife and I did two days ago and I was sitting behind two middle-aged women and we, you know, there was a break. And so they were chatting and one of them looked at the other one. And she said, just, just tell me for my information, how many times a week do you go to the office? And she said, well, three most of the time, occasionally two. And the other woman said, yeah, that's exactly where I am. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's that kind of, of not the Elon ordering you into the office 24 hours a day, da, 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 da. But the fact that we can get the work done and there can be flexibility and occasionally probably there can't be. But uh, and, and so I, I think I think zooming around can be a you know, I know that it's a hell of a long winded answer for which I apologize. Sure. But it's a big question. Yeah. But I think if you give a shit about people, you'll figure out how to connect, whether it can be in person or whether it has to be through Zoom. It seems like it's more about um, that that sense of, if you will, back to the, the title of the book, um, that that feeling of that caring, that extreme humanism. As, as you call it. If you have that, you'll figure out how. Right? Yeah, and, and the, the one big asterisk I want to put on this, not with, not with certainty, is I am arguing that this is more important in the age of artificial intelligence than it ever was before. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, a lot of jobs are, are being and are going to be eaten up by AI. I don't disagree with that. Uh, just as a lot of jobs were eaten up, praise the Lord, in steel mills back at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So I'm not making light of that, mm-hmm. but this attitude, uh, there, I, there was a line I used in something just the other day, and it may be in the book or maybe in an earlier book, but it was Johnny Ive, who was the head designer at Apple, mm-hmm. and he said some line like, in some tiny way, we are trying to save no. In some tiny way, we are trying to serve humanity. Mm -hmm. And I've used that on Twitter, and some people say it's an outrageous statement. Uh, But, and there is, at least in the beginning, relative to the alternatives, there was more humaneness Mm -hmm. to the tools and the software that Apple was offering us. And I, you know, I got into a fight on Twitter just yesterday. I, I think. Humane can be brought into a training program or an inventory management AI-based purchasing process. Uh, I think there's a way to code with decency. Yeah. So maybe one final topic for you, Tom. Um, you know, thinking of you know connections, and you know, I for one, I want to thank you. This is the third time that we've gotten to do a Zoom interview. Um, I, I hope there's a, a reason or an opportunity to do so or to, to get to talk with you again. Um, but we can talk about the, those moments. Like, so you get a connection with somebody at the grocery store. Um, on kind of a different level, I think of like the first time you replied to one of my tweets and I thought, oh my God, the Tom Peters read, I forget what you tweeted. I could go back and look it, but like Tom Tom Peters read something and 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 you you said something you know, kind of complimentary. Okay, that felt good, but it was just more of like, wow, Tom the person. Like there, that that interaction meant a lot to me because I had only interacted with you by by listening to you and, right. and watching you on a stage or on a giant screen screen, or I can read your book and I can hear some of these things in your voice. <laughs> so I appreciated what you said and the way you were saying it. But you know, I'm I'm glad that. You know, a little Twitter interaction then led to an opportunity to have a, a deeper connection. Yeah, no, time. I agree. And it's, you know, my sadness as to what Musk is doing, because some of the directions he's going in, I do not think that I can necessarily with good conscience remain at Twitter forever and ever. Amen. And that's distressing. But to your point, though, and I guess it goes back to the other point, per you saying, oh, my God, bless you, sir. It's Tom Peters. I got into a Twitter conversation that's now gone on for a couple of years with Sharon Watkins. And she was the head whistleblower at Enron. Oh, wow. And wrote an incredible book about it. And so we've just had a chat between two ordinary people. 
And, and the same damn thing happens to me as it does to you. Oh my God, I'm talking to Sharon Watkins. So I, I was going to. You know, or being, I, I was a really lousy jock, except for some lacrosse, you know, talking to an athletic director from the University of Nebraska. I think that happened. And, and that's kind of cool for, you know, somebody like me. Uh, yeah. Well, you brought this up and maybe I'll make this the final, final question. Um, you've been really active on on Twitter. And, um, you know, I the other day, and, and we're recording this December 12th. So when Tom mentioned appalling behavior and actions earlier, we're only commenting on whatever happened up to the morning of the 12th, something undoubtedly has happened uh, again, or something worse. But I'll tell you the other day, I, I haven't deleted my account. And I'm not trying to like get on a soapbox here, I maybe I am, but I logged out of Twitter on my different devices. And I don't know if I'm going to go back because you know, to to me, the line was Elon Musk attacking Anthony Fauci, Doctor Fauci, yeah, and doing it in a way that was also just rude and transphobic, and you know, I'm just like, you know what? No, I'm just I, I don't. To me, there 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 is this moral line of like, should I be there, contributing in some small way to, to that platform? So well, how, how, what's, I what's think we've had, this for you? I think we've had a very good conversation. And in retrospect, it's entirely possible that 98% of the value will have come from your last five sentences. Because I really believe I should bow out. I have, you know, been hopelessly self-centered and saying, you know, I've got a new book out. Let's let the new book be out for a couple of months. You know, that's moral compromise. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really commend you. And I really agree with you that the Fauci thing, uh, maybe among others, but singling it out is is absolutely important. And uh, thank you for having given me one more hearty push from someone, you, whom I deeply respect. So Thanks a lot. I think the rest of the interview was okay for me. <laughs> you know, the last two minutes are the uh, are the grand slam home run. Well, I meant it to be a question. I, I hope it didn't come across as a scolding or trying to take the, no, no. The, I didn't the think high moral ground. On I you. thought it. I didn't think it was a question. Okay. I thought it was a, a story that was not inconsistent with all the things we've been talking about for the okay. last forty five minutes. So, you know, question or not, I, I obviously didn't see. Well, maybe maybe one eighth of a de facto not de jury a scolding because I've been thinking about doing it oh. myself. And then somebody oh. I respect who I'm face to face with, whether it's zoom or not says, you know, I just logged out. Uh, well, you scolded gonna, me, but not in a scolding. But <laughs> I'm going to give credit. Scolding. I'm going to give credit to my friend, Kevin Meyer, who I, I respect very deeply, who took that step before me. Right. Yeah. So that somebody can ask me like, why, why weren't those other awful things that he said or tolerated or brought back into the platform. Why wasn't that the line? So, you know, it could be my bad on that front as well. But I appreciate you um, talking through that and, 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 and for your comments. No, I'm, I'm thrilled that to a large group of people who will be paying attention to the words we've said that you and I had the conversation. I think it's a, it's a not insignificant conversation. So well, good Tom, for us. Well, you started this, but good for us. Well, Tom, thank you. And good for you. You know, the things that you've done in your career, including most recently, Tom Peters, Compact Guide to Excellence. So I'm holding up here. I hope people will go and check that out. And it's it's great, you know, to flip through and, and so many thought provoking ideas and topics. And I had a, a long list of questions I knew we wouldn't have time for today. But Tom, thank you for as always, being thought provoking. And um, thank you so much for being here. Well, I appreciate it. And I hate to extend this for 45 seconds. There are two names, two names on the cover, myself and Nancy Green. And I've been a design champion for a long time. And Nancy has taught me what it really means. She's one of the world's great designers. How I lucked out to have her as a, a partner, I don't know. I was doing, as I did on the last book, a special acknowledgement for her at some point. And I th thought, holy shit, she's not the book designer. She's the co-author. Maybe she's the lead author. Mm. Because this book, in our effort to do it in a new way, 
the look, the taste, the feel, the touch, the smell, and the fact that it's a lot of really great quotes and you're saved from Tom Peters's mouthy 900 word commentary on each one of them. <laughs> so, you know, my name still comes ahead of Nancy's, but if I could do it all over again, I think uh, I, I would put her first. So excuse me for extending our conversation right. by uh, 90 seconds. No apology necessary. So we've been joined by the mouthy Tom Peters. And I love that I can say this. Um, go to his website via giveashitism.com. That will forward you to tompeters.com. Tom, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you for your time, which is precious as much as mine is. And so I, I appreciate the, I, A, I appreciate the hour. And uh, like anybody in the world of anything, I appreciate being invited back. Yeah. <laughs>